All right, good afternoon. Let's go ahead and start for today. And uh, again, as uh, I'm going to start this lecture here, uh, some of you are still taking the lecture exam and that would be uh, the course of things uh, till 9 p.m. tonight. So good luck. And I should be able to up update your grades by tomorrow midday, hopefully that should all be put in. So rapidly reaching the end, uh, please make sure you're keeping on top of the assignments that are required, uh, your final few lab and lecture exams, um, and I will continue to send out the study guides. Hopefully over the weekend sometime sooner rather than later, I should be sending out your lecture exam number four and your comprehensive exam and also the last lab practical uh, study guide. Case study, something else to work on and your lecture quizzes. So with those reminders, let's go ahead and start our chapter for today, which is chapter number 12. And that starts uh, us on one of my two favorite body systems, as I'd mentioned before. So uh, I think I did mention those before. So my two favorite body systems. Well, one is what we are go going to discuss today, uh, the nervous system. And the other one is the immune system. And let me give you a little bit of background as to why that is the case. All right. So basically, if you look at all the, the other body systems, right, 11 of them, um, they are pretty much, uh, even though each person has a unique set of organs or uh, tissues um, based on their own genetic inheritance, uh, but they function very similarly, right? More or less, the heart pumps. Now, not everyone's heart pumps the same way or to the sa same extent, but that's what it does for the most part, right? Um, the kidneys filter out blood, again, with varying degrees of uh, efficiency. But if you look at the nervous system, so the human organism, in fact, every organism, more so humans, because we are uh, at the highest le level of brain development, which is an anatomical and physiological fact as we look at it, are born with a very uh, sort of blank slate kind of uh, a nervous system, right? So consider this, our most rapid growth uh, in the amount of neurons and the connections in between the neurons in the brain happens uh, in the first two years of our life, right? So right from the moment that we are born, uh, we exit the mother's uterus and open our eyes or cry our first cry, which is basically a breath and not a cry to begin with. Um, and then from that point onwards for the first two years is when the brain is growing exponentially. And that is why the human child is born with such a large head, brain to body ratio, more so than any other creature. Uh, even though the mother has a small pelvis, because again, she's an upright walker, which is quite unusual in the animal kingdom. The humans are the only uniquely bipedal species, as I mentioned before, uh, which has to do a, with a whole lot of things that I've been mentioning over and over again. So, uh, and so that's why we have a soft spot, the anterior fontanelle that we talked about earlier. It's there so the brain can, um, the skull can accommodate the rapidly exponentially growing brain during the first two years of life. So what that tells us about the human organism is we're born in a very, very um, immature state, um, nervous system wise. Uh, so we are primed to learn and adapt ourselves to whatever nature throws out at us more so than any other organism, right? For example, uh, if you see lizards or snakes or crocodiles or alligators hatch, hatching out of their eggs, the moment they hatch out, they know exactly what to do. They start fighting with each other. They hold their ground. They have venom or poison fangs. And they can catch their prey. They escape from danger instinctively. So they're very uh, like adult-like, right? There might be miniature versions, but they know exactly what to do. A human child is absolutely helpless, right? There's not much they can do. So they're dependent on their parental care for who knows, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, that age seems to be increasing uh, in modern times, right? Uh, but regardless, and uh, studies have also, also shown that the brain is still growing uh, till we hit the age of 25 years. So well into our adulthood is that's when the brain is like somewhat uh, reaching its um, final dimensions. But even then learning doesn't stop. So our, our ability to learn and grow is unlimited, right? So it's fascinating. And each person's brain works quite differently. You know that if you deal with different people, 
Uh, it's a fascinating thing to look. And then we get into like psychological disorders, schizophrenia, autism, bipolar disorder, ADHD, all those things, OCD, uh, and you know, psychopathy. And there's a whole host of them. Uh, and even among like so-called normal functioning brains, there's so much variation. So very interesting, right? Uh, same with the immune system. No two people have the same immune systems exactly. And I'll talk more about the immune system do, during our ANP2 discussion. So those of you who are with me at that time, so we'll talk about that. All right, so here we're looking at, uh, so first up, where does the nervous system come from? It develops from your ectoderm. Uh, remember the three primary germ layers in the embryo, um, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. So the outermost layer, the ectoderm gives rise to the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord. That's the central nervous system. Now, what emerges from the brain and the spinal cord are the nerves, either cranial nerves from the brain or spinal nerves from the spinal cord, and they're called uh, the peripheral nervous system, okay? So here we see what the nervous system does. It collects information, okay? So from all means, your five senses, taste, touch, smell, sight, uh, uh, what did I miss? Uh, hearing, right? Uh, vision, all of those are uh, ways of sensory input. Then all of this information goes to your central processing unit, which would, would be your brain and your spinal cord. It processes and evaluates this information. Uh, by the way, what I was talking about earlier, being born in, a, in an immature state with an infinite capability of learning new things, that's something called neoteny. So I'm gonna write it down here, neoteny, being born immature, which uh, basically tells us that this creature is a blank slate and it from this point onwards it's, it's capable of learning tremendous amounts of information uh, and then initiate response to information right so input sensory input processing in the brain and then the output and the output goes to your effector organs which are two basically your muscles or your glands okay so here you can look at the central nervous system which is composed of the brain and the uh, spinal cord and then the peripheral nervous system uh, all the nerves that emerge from there all right Okay, so here we are looking at the, the distinction between your sensory and your motor nervous system. Okay, so what's the difference? Sensory nervous system is input. It's taking stuff in, right? Touch, taste, sight, smell, vision, hearing, all of that, right? It's taking information in. So that uh, sensory nervous system is further divided into somatic sensory and visceral sensory system. So somatic sensory is what you're aware of right? Soma means body. So somatic sensory is your five senses, simply, all right? You, you, the senses that, sensations that you perceive. Visceral sensory is, visceral means from your organs, deep organs. So visceral sensory information is uh, things like a headache that you might be experiencing or the feeling of uh, being faint or dizzy, right? This is information coming from your internal organs, from your blood vessels and internal organs, your heart beating fast uh, as, a, as in when you have palpitations. Um, these are not consciously perceived, um, and so that is what the visceral sensory input is about, okay? So then your motor nervous system is the output part. The motor nervous system activates your muscles and glands and tells you how to react to a certain situation. And that is, again, divided into a somatic motor and an autonom autonomic motor system. So the somatic motor system is, let's say, you look at a glass of water, your brain tells you that you're thirsty, so your motor nervous system activates your hand muscles and you uh, grasp that glass of water and you put it to your lips and you drink from it. So there you have it. That's your somatic motor system making that possible. Um, if you have diseases like Parkinson's disease, right, or Huntington's disease where your uh, nerve muscle coordination is uh, disrupted, then you'll have an issue doing these simple tasks or if you have a stroke for that matter. Autonomic motor uh, system, this is your subconscious part of the brain, which is basically your brain stem, the medulla oblongata, the midbrain, um, and the pawns, telling your body what to do, such as when you see an exciting scene or an arousing scene or whatever, your heart starts to beat faster. Uh, this was not a conscious decision. So this is part of your autonomic nervous system, uh, or your blood pressure shoots up when you get into an argument or you don't like what is being said, your heart starts beating faster, you might start sweating, your pupils become constricted. All of these are happening at a subconscious level. Autonomic nervous system does it, okay? All right, next up, we are looking at the structure of a typical nerve, okay? It's like what you see here. There's your spinal cord in the background, and that's the transverse section. You see the spinal cord uh, nerve emerging from it. The whole nerve bundle is surrounded by a thick layer of uh, connective tissue called the epineurium. You see it here. 
then within the nerve, you have these little nerve fibers in fascicles, just like the muscles again, right? And each of those fascicles is surrounded by another layer of connective tissue called the perineurium. And then each of the nerve individually uh, is surrounded by what is called the endoneurium. So again, three levels of protection or membranes or coverings around there, all right? So you have cranial nerves that emerge from your brain and you have 12 pairs of them, 12 pairs of cranial nerves and you have 31 spinal nerves, which emerge from your spinal cord, as you can see here, okay? Uh, nerves can also be classified as sensory, motor, or mixed. Sensory means they take information from the outside to the brain or spinal cord. Motor nerves carry the messages the opposite way from the brain and the spinal cord to your muscles and glands. Mixed nerves have, a both, have, have both sensory and motor nerves interspersed combined together, okay? So then also a ganglion, what is it? A ganglion is a cluster of uh, is a cluster of neuron uh, cell bodies in your peripheral nervous system, okay? All right, so what is the function of receptors? Sensory input, it's the input data, right? What are the different types of effectors controlled by the nervous system? Your glands and your muscles. What are the two primary functional divisions of the nervous system? The central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Central nervous system is brain and spinal cord. Peripheral nervous system is your nerves. Uh, what are the three connective tissue wrappings in a nerve? The outermost uh, epineurium, then perineurium, and then endoneurium. All right. So here are some of the characteristics of the nervous system, right? It's excitable. I think I mentioned it before. Uh, a typical human generates enough electrical power to light up a 60 watt bulb on their heads if you could harness all of that, right? Lots of uh, electrical act activity going on within a person. So we have uh, literally have our own uh, electromagnetic field all around us, right? Some people study that and they think that that is powerful effects uh, on humans and all kinds of things. So um, here we can see that we do have electricity running, coursing through our, not through our veins, but through our nerves. Conductivity, uh, the neurons are able to conduct electrical signals as well. They secrete neurotransmitters like dopamine, acetylcholine, all those kinds of things. Uh, extreme longevity, In, basically you're born with all the neurons that you will ever have which is more than what you will ever need. So how many neurons does a human being have at birth? You have just a simple matter of as many neurons as there are stars in all the galaxies, right? Simple statement. So let's uh, try to wrap our head around this idea. So how many stars are there in all the galaxies? Let's start with how many stars are there in our very own Milky Way galaxy, right? So in our very own Milky Way galaxy that you can basically easily see on a clear night as a shining uh, cluster of stars, right? We have no less than a hundred billion stars in there, all right? Not a hundred, not a hundred thousand, not a hundred million, a hundred billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy alone. But we are talking about all the stars in the universe or all the stars in all the galaxies. So the next question, obvious question is, then how many galaxies are there in the universe? So there are approximately a uh, hundred billion galaxies in the universe, okay? So back to our original question, how many stars are there in the universe? A simple question of basic math, a hundred billion times a hundred billion, okay? So I'm not a big math fan, uh, I've gotten better at it since grade school though, but uh, so if you do the math, you multiply 100 billion with 100 billion, what is that almost infinite, right? That's how many neurons we are born with. Uh, but that's not all. Uh, these neurons have an equal number of connections, countless connections with other neurons. The human brain is the most sophisticated, unimaginably, unfathomably uh, sophisticated biological machine, design, organ, entity, system, whatever you want to call it, in existence beyond any doubt. Uh, so anyone who can give you these uh, rough mythical ideas, like we only use like what, 5-10% of our brain, right? Uh, what, what a fallacy, what a myth, right? 10% of our brain. Uh, anyone who tells you this, okay, just ask him this, 10% of what? Uh, when you put a number, a percentage, you need to have a concrete number there, right? I just told you how many neurons there and connection, not even connect, just the neurons, 100 billion times 100 billion. And then you have an 
innumerable number of connections between those. So 10% of what are you talking about, right? <laughs> so I don't know where these myths originate. Perhaps someone saw a PET scan and saw different parts of the brain lighting up. It looked like about 10% roughly by area. Uh, that much was lighting up. So they thought, well, we are only using 10% of the brain. What is going on at a subconscious level deep within those neurons and this, those connections? We will never know, okay? And so I say it with <laughs> some arrogant confidence at this point that we are dealing with something uh, that is truly unimaginable, right? So uh, it makes me laugh when I hear people or scientists or re researchers or anyone making the claim that we are this close to finding the cure for this or that or this virus or that virus or this disease or that disease. Um, and I have a very simple question for them, right? Uh, let me, three fundamental fundamental biological questions, okay? Biological questions. I have a very simple question for him, okay? Uh, before we can uh, predict or cure or understand or treat or control or uh, uh, subjugate anything, any living system, right? Be it a virus, which is the simplest biological entity or a bacterium or a plant or an animal, let me just ask you this. Do we have the faintest idea as to where it came from in the first place? Or before we arrogantly claim that we have uh, uh, conquered cancer or some other human ailment or chronic disease or whatever, uh, or we have cured the human condition, my simple question is, do any, does anyone ever to have existed on this, the face of this planet has any idea where we came from in the first place, how we came about? When you start studying the human brain or any life form uh, with an open mind and start thinking about it, you get down to the simple structure of DNA, which is not simple at all. Uh, right there, you would realize that it's unimaginable, right? To, to, to even claim to have gotten close to or even have a, any understanding of how this whole system came about, okay? So in order to figure out where you're going, you need to know where you're coming from. So far, we have no clue where, where we are coming from, how we are coming from, where we are coming. So how can you control where we are going? You think you control the system, uh, but you make a little dent and then nature throws its own curveball at you and then things go a certain way. Uh, so, uh, right, so it would behoove us to be pretty humble and keep searching for answers at this point. And uh, so, yeah, the three fundamental biological questions for me, um, so what, what were they? They were, number one, uh, where did the first DNA and RNA come from? How did it evolve, okay? No person, no researcher, no scientist, nobody has ever been able to replicate uh, RNA or DNA from scratch in any controlled laboratory settings, uh, much less this thing came about haphazardly about 4.5 billion years ago, okay? So the origin of DNA slash RNA randomly by itself. Francis Crick uh, and James Watson, the people who won the Nobel Prize for discovering the structure of DNA, he claimed it is, it's more likely that a tornado or a hurricane passing through a junkyard will just randomly create a fully functional flying jumbo jet. It's more likely that that would happen than uh, that the, the DNA molecule came about randomly by itself. And it's certainly true if you look at the structure, right? So that origin. The second origin, is of a species, how did species evolve? So any amount of study will tell you that uh, evolution by natural selection as Charles Darwin obviously propounded that uh, and elaborated on that idea, that can account for intraspecies uh, evolution, like creatures within the same species evolving uh, into subtypes, all right? Uh, but no matter how many billions or trillions of years you give a banana, it's not gonna evolve into a monkey or a monkey or a fish or a worm into a fish, right? Um, so, so it's a leap of faith, that's what it is. It's, it's no more scientific than any of the other philosophic, philo, philo, philosophical ideas out there, right? It's the same thing. Uh, so the origin of species as it is, if you look at mass extinctions in history, right? Pre-Cambrian period, uh, during that time, 99% of all life forms were wiped out for whatever reason, mysterious reasons of the face of the planet. And in, in just a matter of a few million years, 
uh, which is like a blink of the, blink of your eye in evolutionary time scale. You have these species all over the place, right? Uh, nothing accounts for that. All right, it, it defies every logic, every scientific principle. So, origin of species, and finally, the origin of humans. Okay, um, to date, we haven't figured that out. This story is still very sketchy, right? It's not linear at all. There's no set point in time when a pre-hominin became a human at any given time, all right? So the, those were the three fundamental basic questions uh, keep, keeping in mind. So, so yes, you are born with all the uh, neurons that you'll ever have, so better use them wisely. Eat healthy, follow the uh, health mantra that, that I shared with you. Uh, and uh, because once you lose your neurons because of stroke or doing drugs or some other hereditary, uh, genetic neuro, uh, neurodevelopmental problem, you're not getting those neurons back. They, they're, they're one of those three tissues that do not regenerate. And so that's the next term, amitotic. They do not undergo mitosis. Once you lose them, you lose them for good, okay? So right, this is a typical neuron in the picture, as you can see. Uh, so a neuron, there's billions of those in our brain. This is an actual picture of a neuron taken uh, with a microscope, right? That's called a cell body, this part within which is a nucleus. This tail-like structure is called the axon. The axon ends in these uh, axon terminals, these little knobs, which secrete uh, neurotransmitters at, at a synapse where they connect with the other neurons. That's what it is, okay? Uh, these hair-like projections that are attaching to the cell body, these are called dendrites. And dendrites bring in information to the cell body, which processes it, shoots it down the axon, and then um, this signal causes the neurotransmitters to be secreted either exciting, excitatory neurotransmitters or inhibitory uh, neurotransmitters that either light up the next neuron into action or they put it to sleep, depending on what type it is, right? All right, so uh, there's two types of transport or movements that are taking place in your neurons. Uh, the first one is enterograde in a forward direction. The other one is retrograde, backwards. You also have fast and slow transport in your neurons, axons, the tails. Uh, fast is about 400 millimeters per day. Uh, slow is only 0 0.1 to 3 millimeters per day, okay? So here you're classifying uh, the neurons based on their structure. There's three, uh, four types, as you see here. The first one is called multipolar neurons. What does that word mean? There are many poles to it. So many dendrites and one axon, such as the one that you saw in the previous picture. That was a multipolar neuron, okay? The other one is a bipolar neuron and that bipolar, that means like two poles. So there's a single dendrite and there's a, a single axon, okay? And uh, one example where you'll find these types of bipolar neurons is in the retina, the back of the eyeball. Uh, then you have the unipolar or the pseudo unipolar uh, neurons as we see here. And so what happens here is one process extends from the cell body. And we'll take a look at that picture as to what that looks like. And N axonic neurons that do not even have an axon, just dendrites. Functionally, you again have three types of neurons. The first type is called sensory or afferent neurons with an A. They bring in information to the central nervous system. Then you have the motor or the efferent neurons with an E. They take back information from the spinal cord and the brain to your muscles and your glands. And then finally, you have interneurons, which are the go-betweens. Interneurons communicate, they're the communication people between your sensory and motor neurons. And they're found usually in your spinal cord. 99% of your neurons are of that type, interneurons here in this picture. So uh, let's say you've got a cut on your skin or something, they're picked up by the sensory neuron, right? This is a sensory neuron, ganglion, there's a big cell body here. It feeds into your spinal, this is your spinal cord, feeds here. Uh, into the interneuron in purple. The interneuron is the go between, between the sensory input and the motor output. So then the interneuron relays this message to your motor neuron, which passes out the information and the response to your muscles. And then you swat at the fly or scratch or whatever is causing this. So this is the whole circuit, the whole uh, chain of events that happen in your neurons. So what do you mean by excitability? Uh, electrical excitability, your nervous system can generate its own electricity. Conductivity, it can conduct electricity too. And secretion, um, your neurons secrete neurotransmitters. Okay, what are the functions of these neuron structures? Dendrites, they bring in information, sensory information to the cell body. Axon, 
exon takes the message from one neuron to the other neuron. Synaptic vesicles, they contain neurotransmitters and those burst open to release the neurotransmitters at the synapse. Neurofibrils, they give your neuron structure. They are the, part, they are the cytoskeleton. Uh, which type of external transport is both enterograde and retrograde? So that would be your uh, fast, fast transport, okay? Uh, what substances are transported by this method? Newly made proteins. How are the different processes that extend from a cell body used to structurally classify neurons? You can have a uh, multipolar neuron. If there's many dendrites in a single axon, you can have a, uh, you, uh, a bipolar neuron. If there's a single axon and a single uh, dendrite, and it could be uh, even a unipolar neuron, okay? Where are inner neurons located? in between your sensory and motor neurons. And what is their function? They are the go-betweens, the chemical messengers between your sensory and motor neurons, okay? So next up, we are looking at synapses. What is a synapse? It's uh, the tiny microscopic gap between uh, one neuron and the other neuron, okay? And there's two types of them, chemical and electrical. An electrical synapse is activated and brought to life by electrical signals. So when a neuron introduces an electric current there in the synapse, it lights up and it sends it off through the next adjoining neuron. Uh, the chemical synapses, uh, they are excited by chemicals, not by electri electricity, but, but, but actually uh, chemicals, as you can see here, right? So what is a chemical synapse? Uh, a ke chemical synapse is a synapse which responds to chemicals like neurotransmitters, like dopamine, serotonin, acetylcholine, so on and so forth, right? And how does it function? It responds to, to chemicals, right? Okay, glial cells, also called neuroglia. Literally, this word means uh, glue-like cells, okay? Which means they, um, they glue the neurons together. They are not neurons. They cannot conduct electricity or generate it, but they're needed to nourish and support the neurons, okay? So uh, the glial cells, as we were mentioning, are, are the support cells again. And uh, if you remember our discussion of Albert Einstein's brain, uh, this was basically what was found to be uh, in much greater numbers. It was present in his brain as compared to an average person. So basically what that meant was he was able to process all the, that information and the communication between his many neurons was much faster and efficient as compared to and somebody who didn't have Einstein's brain. So these are the different types of glial cells. Let's uh, quickly talk about those here uh, in this spectra. So the first type uh, is what is called the astrocyte. And if you the word astro means uh, star and site is for a cell. So star cells or star shaped cells. And if you look at the picture here, it, it becomes abundantly clear why they're called astrocytes. It looks like a star, right? So what is the function of this glial cell? Uh, it basically, forms something called the blood-brain barrier or BBB. What is a blood-brain barrier? That means that uh, all of the stuff which is floating around in your blood is unable to get into your brain because it's like um, insulated by means of these, uh, what are called the perivascular feet of the astrocyte, the perivascular feet that cover the uh, blood vessel here. So in essence, what your brain is trying to do is it's trying to keep any toxins or uh, poisons that might be floating in your bloodstream away from itself, right? Uh, so let's say you got a case of food poisoning or bacterial uh, shock or septic shock or something going around. Um, well, this astrocyte and their blood-brain barrier ensures that that toxin is unable to penetrate it and go into the brain. But some uh, chemicals have no problems making this journey, right? For example, alcohol, you know, as soon as you take a swig of a uh, vodka or whiskey or whatever, uh, it quickly passes across the uh, the astrocytes and the blood-brain barrier, no problem. Many germs can do the same as well, okay? Uh, but that's basically what it does. Uh, you can see the functions here, right? It forms the blood-brain barrier. Uh, that's the most important function, as you can see here. Uh, the next type of glial cell that we're going to talk about here is these ones. They are called the ependymal cells. And you can think of them as the shower heads or the sprinklers of the brain, let's call them that, right? So the ependymal cells are the sprinklers of the brain. And why I call them that is because they sprinkle a fluid called the uh, cerebrospinal fluid or CSF 
that keeps the brain lightweight and well nourished and lubricated at all times. Okay, that's what it does. Here they are, ependymal cells. They're sprinkler, the sprinklers of the brain. Then you have these little ones called the um, microglia, which literally means the small glial cells, microglial cells, right? They are the Pacman of the brain. The Pacman cells of the brain would be the microglia. In other words, they go around eating up germs and debris that might ac um, accumulate in the brain, right? And so people who develop things like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, some research studies show that actually their Pacman cells are not working as good. The microglial cells are unable to eat up the debris that is accumulating there. Uh, and that basically causes the signs and symptoms uh, of the disease, uh, of those neurodevelopmental disorders, all right? Then finally, we have these ones called the oligodendrocytes. Uh, the word itself means like tree-like cells, oligodendrocytes, tree-like cells. It's kind of like a tree, twigs, right? What the oligodendrocyte does is, as you can see it doing in this picture, it lays down this white uh, insulation or covering around the axon called the myelin sheath. So the oligodendrocytes lay down the white, whitish insulating myelin sheath uh, across the axons, all right? And why your axons need myelination, this myelin sheath, we'll get into it later. All right, so here you're looking at the glial cells of your peripheral nervous system, okay? Uh, the peripheral nerves, which emerge from the brain and the spinal cord. So what do they have? Uh, satellite cells, which basically insulate the peripheral nervous system, right? Insulation, as you can see here and also the neurolemocytes, and they um, basically lay down the myelin sheath. What the oligodendrocytes were doing in your brain, the Schwann cells, that's what they call also Schwann cells, do the same job in your peripheral nervous system. So let's talk about some of the tumors uh, of the central nervous system, all right? So more common are the gliomas, as you can see here. Why? Because uh, Remember the neurons don't even undergo mitosis, they don't even divide. So a tissue that is not primed to divide is less likely to turn into a cancer or a tumor. Gliomas, your glial cells are dividing, they undergo mitosis. So they are much more likely to develop into tumors, okay? So, uh, and then you also have secondary tumors, tumors that have seeded the brain from elsewhere. Uh, remember we talked about that acronym of the organs that are most commonly seeded by cancers from elsewhere, elsewhere uh, by secondary tumors. So the brain was one of those organs, right? So remember that as well, all right. So myelination, uh, laying down the myelin sheath, and that's what we're looking at here in this picture in your peripheral nervous system. So you have these uh, cells called the Schwann cells or the neurolemocytes, and they go around in circles, laying down the myelin sheath, simple, right? You see how that goes around in almost like onion rings in concentric circles laying down the myelin sheath. That's what happens, all right? There you have it. The neurolemocytes, the uh, Schwann cells, and the Schwann cells are laying down the myelin here. In the CNS, which means your brain and your spinal cord in the central nervous system, the myelin sheath is laid down by oligodendrocytes, not by Schwann cells, which is only in the peripheral nervous system, okay? So one more thing to remember, uh, your Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system they are able to regenerate and regrow the myelin sheath much more effectively than the oligodendrocytes in your brain. In other words, if you get brain damage and the myelin sheath is stripped away from your brain cells, it's not coming back likely. The oligodendrocytes are not that good at doing it. Uh, but the peripheral nerves, the, the, the Schwann cells, they can repair the damage provided the injury is not too great, all right? And this reminds me of an incident that again, befell my mother a few years back, right? So let me quickly take notes here. All right, so what happened was, um, she was cleaning the uh, one, one of her bathroom mirrors. It was a big, decent sized mirror. Uh, just about almost half the wall was covered by it, right? And what we had not realized was because of many years of like uh, hot, humid, wet air in there, right? Uh, not all people turn on their exhausts when taking a hot shower, as you should. So that uh, moisture had eaten its way into the, uh, in the screws that were holding the mirror up, right? They were all rusty. So as she was cleaning the mirror, it 
somehow came loose and it fell to the ground and shattered with a loud explosion and the shrapnel and shards of glass flew everywhere. One of those big, heavy uh, shards of glass, unfortunately, uh, came and almost sliced her right thumb through and through, all right? And so we went to see what had happened and we saw her clutching her uh, right hand in pain and then we saw this pool of blood. Uh, and when we looked at the thumb, it was like bad. It was literally hanging by a thread, literally. You could see the tendon uh, of the, uh, the pollicis muscle, the extensor and the abductor pollicis muscle. Uh, and it was just hanging by a few uh, threads of connective tissue, right? So it needed stitches, obviously. We had to stitch it back and uh, put, um, of course, antibiotic creams there and to bandage the whole thing. Um, but what happened right after that was uh, she could not feel anything. She lost all sensation, the tip of her thumb, which was not surprising at all because obviously the cut was deep enough to have severed or se severely uh, damaged the, uh, the radial nerve, the radial nerve that supplies the thumb, right? However, uh, with the passage of time, gradually she started to regrow or re-get her sensations back. So it was like, it started out with like very faint pins and needles kind of sensation, then it became more and more obvious. And then I think about six months to a year later, uh, most of her sensation had turned back. Uh, it, they had returned, okay? Uh, because again, this was a peripheral nerve. And so the Schwann cells were likely able to repair the damage there. Had this thing happened in anyone's brain where there's oligodendrocytes and they do not lie, uh, lay down myelin sheath as well, now this would this recovery would not have been seen there. All right, so something to remember. Okay, now speaking of myelin sheaths, there are a number of disorders where your own immune system starts acting against your body tissues, including the myelin sheath. All right, these are autoimmune disorders, which means by definition they're more common in females, as we mentioned before. Right, one of which is something called multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis is a, is a uh, chronically progressive. Um, autoimmune disorder where you develop antibodies, autoantibodies against your own myelin sheath. They start eating into your myelin sheath. Uh, so people who are of Scandinavian origin, right? People have uh, Scandinavian blood in them, especially like uh, blonde, uh, blue-eyed appearance, right? Scandinavians and multiple sclerosis. They have a higher incidence of this. And I remember a few uh, years back, I had a student in one of my ANP classes who pretty much, pretty much uh, fit this profile perfectly. Right? She was a she had Norwegian blood on her mom's side and Swedish from her dad's, uh, and um, blonde, blue-eyed, the perfect phenotype here. And so she started out complaining of uh, a double vision in one of her eyes. Right? And so she went to her ophthalmologist for a checkup and they diagnosed uh, optic neuritis in her, uh, which means inflammation of the optic nerve, uh, which was causing these visual problems, right? So based on her uh, genetic profile, her ethnicity and her signs and symptoms, um, I had a very high index of suspicion for multiple sclerosis. And sure enough, uh, they did a test for ant autoantibodies on her. Uh, the in insurance covered that. Uh, and it came back positive for multiple sclerosis, all right? Uh, so fortunately, she was very young and it was just uh, starting out. So with uh, ongoing treatment, you can uh, slow down the pr progression of the disease, okay? And so again, what you can do in this case, since it's an autoimmune disease, again, you can use steroids to dampen the immune response or go back to plasmapheresis. As I'd mentioned in one of my earlier lectures, plasmapheresis is where you clean out the autoantibodies from the blood, just like you do, do dialysis, okay? Something to remember. Uh, so then we have the uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome or GBS, as you see here. And this syndrome is something that is seen often in children following a viral infection, like a common cold or something like that, or even following vaccination. Uh, lately, there were a few cases of uh, post-COVID-19 vaccination induced post COVID-19 vaccine induced GBS. There was a case in Houston, if I remember correctly, a young 17 year old um, sophomore who, who developed this condition right, right after he got a vaccine. So what happens in uh, again, Barre syndrome is uh, fall, following a viral infection or sometimes a vaccine, this 
weakness in the muscles takes uh, sets in starts out with your toes basically uh, and then it's an ascending type of paralysis and weakness and then goes up to your ankles then higher up to your knees thighs all the way and in some cases it could be dangerous because if it goes all the way up to your diaphragm you stop breathing and then you need to be hospitalized on a ventilator to keep you breathing however most cases are mild and self-limiting and it, they resolve on their own in a couple of weeks or so on so if a person has a brain tumor, is it more likely to develop from neurons or glial cells? Because glial cells undergo mitosis, they divide. If a person suffers from meningitis, which is an inflammation of the meningeal coverings, uh, which type of glial cell do usually replicate in response to the infection? The Pac-Man of the brain, which would be your microglia to take out the infection, of course. Which specific type of glial cell forms a myelin sheath associated with the exons in the, in the peripheral nervous system? Schwann cells. What is the function of the myelin sheath? Ah, that's the good thing that we did not talk about. Uh, we'll get to that here uh, in a moment. How does myelination of axons occur in the PNS? By means of the Schwann cells laying down the myelin sheath uh, in, in concentric circles, right? So here we are looking at your uh, myelin sheath regenerating after injury in a peripheral nerve. Now, so going back to what the function of the myelin sheath, okay. So this whitish lipid rich myelin sheath is, a, uh, is an insulator, which means it does not allow the current to pass through it. So what does the electrical current have to do? It has to jump. See this, uh, this myelin sheath is not continuous. There are gaps in it, naked areas, if you will, these naked areas. These are called the nodes or the nodes of Ron VA. That's what they're called, right? Nodes of Ron VA. So what the uh, electrical current has to do then is to jump from one naked area to the other naked area, right? From one node of Ron VA to the other node of Ron VA. And this uh, speeds up the uh, velocity, the speed of electrical transmission, something called saltatory conduction. That's what it's called. Saltatory conduction, fast transport of nerve impulses by jumping from naked node of Ron VA to the other node uh, due to the presence of the myelin sheath. So now that also explains the signs and symptoms that you might ex uh, expect to encounter in someone suffering from multiple sclerosis. What did I just say? What does multiple sclerosis do to you? Multiple sclerosis gets rid of the, of the myelin sheath, right? And when that happens, now you have a naked axon here. All of this myelin sheath is gone. Now the electrical current, instead of jumping from node to node and making it quick, has to travel through the entire length of the axon. It slows down the electrical signals. Your cognitive functions slow down. You become forgetful. You, you become slow in the brain. Your movements become slow. In extreme cases, you might lose control of your bowels and your bladder as well, right? So cognitive decline, pretty much what you would see in Alzheimer's disease. Something similar happens in multiple sclerosis. Uh, and it makes sense now, right? So what two primary factors determine the effectiveness of peripheral nervous system axon regeneration, the extent of the injury uh, and how far the injury is from the origin of the nerve. Uh, so how does the nerve regeneration occur in the peripheral nervous system? By the means of the, again, your Schwann cells. All right, so here we are looking at uh, some of the ion channels that generate electricity in the nerves, right? So as we can see here, the uh, main ion channels involved in generating electrical impulses in the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system would be sodium, potassium, and calcium ion channels, okay? And they exist in one of these three states, either resting or closed, as you can see here. We're looking at sodium ion channels, as you can see in the picture, uh, activated or when they're open, uh, or inactivated again when they're closed, okay? So these are the three states in which uh, you might see these sodium ion channels in, okay? All right, so, so throughout the membrane of the neuron, you'll see them. The, the, these are called the sodium leak channels, the potassium leak channels, and then the sodium potassium pump. Uh, so what does each of these uh, channels do? The sodium potassium pump, basically, we mentioned this before, it pumps out three sodium ions and brings in two potassium ions in exchange, all right? This is an active transport process uh, powered by ATP. So this requires ATP, okay? Uh, so what is gonna happen inside of the cell when you're pump, uh, pumping out three 
positively charged sodium cations and bringing in only two positively charged potassium cations, you have a net negative charge inside, right? Because you're kicking out more positives. Uh, when the sodium leak channels open up, this all of this pent up sodium, which is outside, it starts leaking back in. So what happens when the inside of the neuron starts get, getting more positive because of sodium influx? Depolarization, and that sparks electricity throughout. That's depolarization. Then uh, finally, the sodium leak channels close and the potassium leak channels open up and the potassium starts to flow out of the cell. The inside starts becoming more negative again, which is called repolarization. And then it goes back to sleep, the nerve. So basically this is what these, um, these ion channels do, right? Okay, so what we see in this picture is along the length of the uh, entire neuron, which you can see in this picture, um, different types of different types of uh, channels are found, right? So for example, if you look at the receptive segment where the dendrites meet with the cell body, right? So the, the receptive, obviously it's receiving the information in, you have chemically gated channels. They respond to chemicals, not to electrical signals. Then when you go to the initial segment, which is again, the first part of the axon, here you have voltage gated or electricity gated sodium and potassium channels. The conductive channel, which is much of the, uh, Axon, again, has voltage gated both sodium and potassium channels, okay? All right, so, and then finally, at the end where, where you have the transmissive segment, because you transmit neuro, neurotransmitters here into the synapse, you have voltage gated calcium channels and pumps here. So calcium channel and pumps are found here in the transmissive segment towards the end of the neuron, okay? So what are the three stages of voltage-gated sodium channels? Uh, resting, active, inactive. Uh, which functional segment of a neuron contains chemically gated channels? The receptive segment, the first one. Which fun functional segments contain voltage-gated channels? All of the rest of the neurons. All right, so here you're looking at a neuron at rest, okay? Which means there's no electrical signal going through it, no uh, impulse, no nerve impulse, right? And so why? Because the inside of the nerve cell is at a negative 70 millivolts. This is the resting membrane potential or RMP. The resting membrane potential inside of a neuron is negative 70 millivolts. And this is maintained uh, by your sodium potassium pumps because they're kicking out three sodiums and replacing them with only two potassiums. Inside is more negative, negative 70, right? Okay, there, there's your sodium potassium pump. See what it's doing? It's uh, three sodiums being kicked out, two potassiums being brought in, inside is negative 70 millivolts, okay. So what is the role of ions? They maintain the electrical current or voltage across the neurons. The phospholipid bilayer, it's a semi-permeable membrane that maintains a voltage again across the membrane uh, and plasma membrane channels. Channels allow for sodium and potassium and calcium ions to move in and out. Uh, Describe the conditions of a neuron at rest in RMP. Uh, the resting membrane potential would be negative 70 millivolts because the sodium potassium pumps are at work. All right. Uh, explain how, so we just did that, right? Okay, so next up, we are looking at something called graded potentials. Now graded potentials are these light sparks of electric, little sparks of electricity that you will see here and there. They're kind of like fireflies going off inside of a nerve, but they're not strong enough to be carried across the entire length of the neuron or the axon. So these are called, these are short-lived, small graded potentials, okay? Now, what type of a potential happens from one neuron to the next could be a, one of two types. It could either be excitatory or inhibitory. An excitatory postsynaptic potential or EPSP will light up the next neuron. An inhibitory postsynaptic potential will uh, darken or put to sleep the adjoining neuron. That's what we have to remember, right? For example, if you see this picture, so these neurons are secreting a, an excitatory neurotransmitter, the one in green color, possibly acetylcholine or dopamine or something. Now this uh, green neurotransmitter is gonna bind with the receptors here, with the postsynaptic receptors. After they bind here, they're gonna cause the sodium ion channels to open up, the sodium ions start flowing in, depolarization and this neuron starts firing because of depolarization. So this is excitatory in uh, postsynaptic potential, all right? Now here you're looking at the same three neurons, only this time they're secreting a red colored 
uh, inhibitory neurotransmitter. So this red colored neuro uh, inhibitory neurotransmitter attaches to the postsynaptic receptors. This causes the potassium ions channels to open up. So the potassium starts to move out, efflux of potassium, uh, causing the insides to become even more negative. This is called hyperpolarization. This neuron goes to sleep, so inhibition, okay? So one is making you wake up, the excitatory postsynaptic potential. The other one is putting you to sleep, the inhibitory one. Okay, so what we are seeing here is something called the threshold. So the threshold is at what point does your nerve or neuron become uh, positive enough to transmit an action potential? An action potential is a nerve impulse, right? The answer is negative 55 millivolts. So when the sodium ions start moving in, when the sodium channels open, it goes down from negative 70 to negative 65 to then negative 60, then to negative 56, still no uh, action potential. But as soon as it hits that threshold of negative 55 millivolts, then you have the action potentials going through, okay? And so this is called the all or none law, which means once you reach the threshold, the nerve impulse is gonna go ahead with the same force and power as with uh, any other nerve impulse, right? But till you reach that point, there would be no transmission. It's like um, when you press the trigger on a gun, right? No matter, uh, well, when, once you hit the threshold and you pull the trigger at that past that th threshold, the bullet is gonna eject at the same speed. It doesn't matter if you pull the trigger fast or slow. Once you reach the threshold, the bullet is gonna go with the same velocity. That's the all or none law, which applies to your action potentials as well, okay? So the next slides talk about the same things, sodium rushing in, which is called depolarization, action potential generation, and then the potassium channels opening up and potassium rushing out, that is hyperpolarization or repolarization and uh, the end of the action potential. That's what we are seeing here, right? There it is, the resting membrane potential is negative 70. Here's threshold is reached. Uh, well, actually the sodium ion channels start opening up, so it starts to get more and more positive. Uh, as soon as it gets to negative 55 millivolts, look, now the action gen potential generates. There, there's, an, there's a spike, an electrical current. It reaches a value of almost positive 30 millivolts, at which point your pot uh, potassium ion channels start opening up, the potassium ions start to flow out, and then the insides start becoming more, more negative, which is called repolarization. The action potential stops. It becomes even more negative than negative 70. It goes even further beyond the resting membrane potential, and this, this is called hyperpolarization, but then it bounces back at the resting membrane potential. So then we have something called the refractory period, which means the time period during which no matter how much you stimulate, there is not going to be another nerve impulse. Why? You cannot make another nerve impulse go by during the absolute refractory period because the sodium channels are open uh, and they're in an inactive state, okay? And then after that, you have a relative refractory period uh, where you can stimulate a new action potential, but with great stimulation, okay? All right. So here, this is your absolute, once you reach this stage, at this point, you cannot generate an, another electrical impulse. It has to go all the way down. So this is called the absolute refractory period. No more action potential can generate till it gets to that point, and then you can generate another one. Okay, so continuous versus saltatory conduction. I talked about the difference. Continuous conduction is when the electrical current has to pass across the entire length of the axon, which is much longer. Saltatory conduction is when it jumps from the naked node of Ron Beard to the other node, uh, uh, when you have a myelin sheath covering, right? So people who have multiple sclerosis, as an example, they show continuous conduction in their nerves. It slows down the nerves. So their cognitive functions go down, their movements go down, everything. Uh, become slower because of that, all right? Here, see that? There's the myelin sheath. Here are the naked areas, the nodes. In a normal saltatory conduction, the current will move, jump from node to node much faster. If you uh, dissolve and dissolve away the myelin sheath, then you just have this naked axon, then the electrical current has to pass the entire length. That's much slower. This is someone with multiple sclerosis, much slower. This is a normal person here. All right, so what happens once the electrical signal reaches the, the end of the neuron at the synaptic terminal, uh, the calcium ion channels open up, 
and the voltage gated calcium channels, calcium ions start to flow in, which causes these synaptic vesicles, these bubbles to fuse and burst open, releasing their neurotransmitter in the synapse. And this neurotransmitter is gonna go ahead and attach to the postsynaptic receptors and either cause excitation here or inhibition, okay? Uh, where do postsynaptic potentials occur? At this side, after the synapse, the neuron after that. How do e EPSPs and IPSPs differ? The excitatory postsynaptic potentials excite the next neuron, the inhibitory postsynaptic potentials uh, inhibit or put that neuron to sleep. What is typically required in order for a cell to reach the threshold for the uh, sodium ion channels to open up so that it can flow in? What is the all or none law? Once you reach the threshold, the same velocity, the same power will be seen in the electrical impulse from that point onwards. How does the distribution of voltage-gated channels differ between myelinated and unmyelinated axons? In myelinated axons, it's at only at nodes, so it's much faster. Unmyelinated axons are slower, okay? So graded potentials versus action potentials. Action potentials are an electrical impulse that go the entire length of the axon. Graded potentials are these little fireflies, these little sparks here and there, but they lack the strength and the intensity to carry on all across the nerve, right? So explain how action potentials differ from graded potentials. Action potentials are actual electrical spark, uh, electrical lightning, and uh, graded potentials are like fireflies, occasional sparks here and there. Uh, general characteristics of group A fibers, they are large fibers, uh, big bore, big wide fiber, fibers, nerve fibers, and so the electrical signals can pass quite fast through these, okay? All right, so next we are looking at the types of neurotransmitters that you will find uh, in the nervous system, okay? So there's four classes that are given here, four chemical classes of neurotransmitters that you can find. All right, so let's see what they are. The first one is uh, something called acetylcholine, okay? Acetylcholine is an excitatory neurotransmitter. It is needed, absolutely needed for your muscles to function. Uh, we know what happens when acetylcholine doesn't function, like in botulism, right? Uh, your muscles become paralyzed. Then you have biogenic amines, and they're called that biogenic because only living cells can make them, or also called monoamines. Uh, then of, of two types, like catecholamines, like dopamine. Dopamine is your feel-good hormone. So uh, the rush that you get from... Uh, from fast driving or listening to rock music or watching an exciting movie or falling in love or getting addicted to cocaine or any, any addictive and pleasurable or gambling activity, uh, you have to thank your dopamine receptors for those, right? Uh, indolamines like serotonin, uh, serotonin makes you calm, it regulates your mood and also puts you to sleep. Both of those are uh, examples of biogenic amines as you see here. Okay, then, uh, some uh, neurotransmitters are actually amino acids like glutamate, glycine. This is an inhibitory one. These are inhibitory uh, and GABA for g gamma amino butyric acid, okay? And then also uh, the neuropeptides like endorphins. These are your body's own painkillers, all right? Endorphins like substance P. Substance P cuts out pain. So therefore the name substance P. All right, so acetylcholine, we already talked about that type of neurotransmitter, right? It is mainly used for stimulating your muscles into action. It's an excitatory one. And once it is uh, in action in your synapse, then it's broken down by an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase because you don't want acetylcholine to just linger around. It's gonna cause you to go into tetany. Your muscles will be constantly contracted. You don't want that. So acetylcholinesterase, make sure that doesn't happen. All right, so... Certain drugs act on your synapses, right? For example, these ones, SSRIs, that stands for selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, like Prozac, right? Uh, one of the most famous SSRIs. What Prozac does it uh, is it prevents the breakdown of uh, serotonin. Uh, that's why it's called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. It increases the amounts of serotonin in your neurons, thereby making you calmer and less depressed and regulates your mood, okay? So that's what we're looking at here. Uh, nitric oxide or NO, by the way, this is the active ingredient in Viagra, right? Nit nitric oxide causes the penile vessels, uh, arterioles to dilate basically. And uh, as you can see, it causes blood vessel dilation, okay? 
it can act both as a neurotransmitter or a modulator. Modulator is a substance that uh, helps the neurotransmitter do its job better. Endocannabinoids. Now, these are interesting. These are receptors within your uh, brain and your central nervous system that react to things like marijuana, right? Uh, to cannabis. And uh, so apparently, our brain does have receptors for these drugs, right? Uh, including some drugs of abuse. Uh, and so, um, and then you the endorphins that you produce, your feel good hormones from within, they basically fall into that class somewhere as well. So, how neurotransmitters are classified? Well, biogenic amines, acetylcholine, uh, neuropeptides, and uh, what else? Those were the ones, uh, the types of uh, neurotransmitters that we looked at. Uh, how is it possible for acetylcholine to generate either an excitatory or an inhibitory postsynaptic potential? Because depending on what type of neuron is next to the neuron secreting the acetylcholine, it might have opposite contradictory effects. How does nitric oxide act as a neuromodulator? It helps the, uh, the neurotransmitters do their job better. It amplifies its effects and it also acts as a vessel dilator. All right, so here we're looking at four different types of circuits, brain circuits or nervous neuron circuits in the brain. The first one is called a converging circuit. And you can see why it's called that. See, it's, it, it, all of these input uh, areas, neurons are all converging into a single output. So many different inputs, neurons in a single output. For example, uh, if you're really hungry, so the sight, looking at food, thinking of food, smelling food, uh, or even hearing about food, and you start to salivate, right? So, so many different inputs like sight, sound, smell, mention, taste, whatever, in a single output, you start salivating if you're really hungry. So that would be an example of a converging circuit in your brain. Diverging circuit is the exact opposite where you have a single input and it diverges away into multiple outputs, right? The exact opposite. For example, uh, the neurons in the brain that control your walking, uh, right? So the input is you have to walk. And what's the output? Well, you move your arms a certain way, you walk a certain way, you change directions, your muscles and your bones, uh, align themselves in a certain way, depending on who you are. So a single thought or input, start walking, and so many different outputs in, in order to enable you to walk. That's a diverging circuit. Reverberating circuit, what happens here? The input keeps reverberating or vibrating throughout. it. It's like your uh, cell phone buzzing, right? Buzzing circuit. And uh, an example of a reverberating circuit in the brain would be uh, the circuits that keep us breathing even when wh while we are asleep. So we might have gone to sleep, but there's this vibration, this buzzing is still going on in our circuits. And we, so we keep breathing thanks to the reverberating circuits. Um, then finally, we have something called the parallel after discharge circuit. And we see why it's called that. Here's the input. And then it goes parallel, parallel directions to a single output. So it's parallel after discharge here. And one example is uh, the circuits in your brain involved with higher order thinking, such as hopefully what you're doing right now, taking your lecture exam, thinking about your ENP course, uh, figuring out all of those things, higher order thinking. When you do that, uh, these parallel after discharge circuits in the brain, they consolidate your memory and your understanding together, right? Higher order thinking skills. So therefore, it's never a good idea to pull an all-nighter just before an exam. You don't want to cram the night before. You're going to damage your brain. You should uh, study a little bit on a daily basis. Prepare yourself. Take multiple choice type questions, as many as you can regularly. So when the big test comes, uh, you have these parallel after discharge circuits well established, and you know the answers there. Right. So our neurons are arranged in a converging circuit. We saw that multiple uh, inputs, they just converge out into a single output, such as sight, sound, smell of food when you're hungry leads to just one result, you salivate. What are the differences between a reverberating circuit and a parallel after discharge circuit? A reverberating circuit is like your cell phone on buzzer, it's buzzing. So that's the type of circuit that keeps you breathing even while you're asleep, right? Parallel after discharge circuit we just saw here. Uh, so multiple ways of thinking leading to a single output, such as those involved in, um, critical thinking, higher order thinking skills. All right, so here we are done with chapter 12. So uh, again, looking at the schedule tomorrow, I will be sending out and sharing the notes for chapter 13 and then one on Friday as well for chapter 14, all right? Okay, so good luck on your lecture exam and your lab practical, which is coming up tomorrow as well. 
uh, stay safe, healthy, and happy. And uh, so I'll see you then. Bye-bye.